around on last week, we briefly previewed some tools that will be made available to you after the completion of this forum and also provided some insights on how to get started in your HBCU strategy approach. Um, we heard from startup professional Courtney uh, Gray, who created HBCU First, which is a nonprofit with the mission to increase college success and career access to Black youth. We also heard from two academics, Mr. John Harper and Dr. Colin Miller, who candidly and honestly um, highlighted that barriers to retaining talent, Black talent specifically, in this region is culture. And I'm also going to just say it was Minnesota nice culture. So we kind of know what that means and, and um, what that means to different groups of people. So they provided perspectives um, with us during that time that allowed us to be self-reflective and understanding and also um, talk about that this work truly um, encompasses more than just developing tangible a tangible list of action items to execute, um, but requires a critical view of your organizations um, and the strategies you have to implement capacity building for your staff and leaders. Um, moreover, uh, that is something that organizations, that this is something that organizations should actively and collaboratively be tackling together. This is a regional issue. This requires regional approaches. Uh, therefore, we encourage you all to talk to each other about um, what intentional HBCU engagement truly looks and feels like. Um, and if you've not noticed by now from the past um, two conversations we have had, these are building upon one another to hit three areas um, that can really help in building a sustainable talent pipeline from HBCUs, attraction, recruitment, and retainment. Um, so today's conversation will focus um, specifically on connection and community, uh, which is highly correlated with retainment. So ensuring that Black talent is not only supported within your respective organizations, but the importance of, um, uh, of understanding what happens in that, um, not only that nine to five, but that five to nine is crucial to ensuring that talent feels connected to the community in this region. Um, I also want to preface that this is not a numbers game. Black people are full humans who live full lives and need to be supported in their ability to um, connect and foster community when they come to um, the Minneapolis-St. Paul region. Also, um, I wanted to just give some, some uh, uh, provide some guidance on who we'll be hearing from today. We'll gain uh, some um, understanding about the importance of connectivity and, uh, and community building. And we're going to focus on three areas to gain those insights during this conversation. The ERG space um, in connection with the professional Black networks in this region, the importance of the faith community, uh, as well as hearing from um, local cha local chapters of uh, Black Greek letter organizations. So I just want to preface that this is not an exhaustive list of spaces to tap into, but they have been spaces that have created um, an impact in fostering community amongst Black talent and Black professionals in this region. Um, so you'll also hear from some speakers, and it'll either be live um, or by video playback, so I just wanted to preface that. Um, additionally, um, it'd be immensely negligent if I did not mention um, the weight of this week and the weight of yesterday. Um, so yesterday marked uh, one year since the murder of George Floyd. We saw activations uh, from across the world, activations and urgency and energy to address systemic issues that have for, far, for um, far too long been ignored by some of our organizations that we're representing today. So that may have been a catalyst for why your organization is addressing this now. Um, and I'm not saying that to call anyone out, but to call folks in. So Make It MSP has been um, working on this since 2019. They continue to work on this um, approach and engagement strategy uh, for the past summer, uh, in the summer of civil unrest, and they will continue to work on these efforts in the future. So we're seeking partners who would like to do the same. So as we wrap up conversations today, you'll hear from Emily and how you can sustain your efforts within your organization um, and also leverage the network of, of employers who are working on this collectively. Um, I really hope that these past three sessions can serve as a springboard for developing thoughtful um, and inclusive approach to building an effective and sustainable HBCU strategy. Um, but again, today is for you. Uh, we have made some slight shifts in how we facilitate today. So we are not in a webinar format as we were in the first 
um, session, but we are in a live Zoom meeting. So I kindly ask you to mute yourselves when you're not speaking. I invite you to um, ask questions in the chat function and engage with one another. So uh, thank you for being with us today. And I look forward to some rich conversations. Um, so before we get started, we're gonna jump into a polling question. Um, so we can we can get that on the screen. So um, beyond your fr family, friends, and immediate coworkers, what networks are strongest in your life? So we'll give about 30 seconds for you all to respond. Great results are in, Halston. Awesome. I'm seeing um, neighborhood and community networks uh, as the highest, um, like the highest receiving of, of these. Also, professional associations and, net and leadership networks, which is immensely important. So, we'll be hearing from not only community networks today, and all, but also um, professional leadership networks. I see alumni networks and faith community. So, we'll be hearing from um, the faith community networks today. Um, not from the alumni networks, but we wanted to just um, get a feel for like what has been, um, where, where, what have been some spaces that folks have tapped into. And I just wanted to, uh, to uh, set that tone before jumping into the presentation. And if you all would be very patient with me uh, as, uh, you know, technology. <laughs> so we're having some, <laughs> a, a brief delay in getting uh, our slide deck up. But um, really grateful that you all are here today, um, as well as uh, technology works when you <laughs> when you don't need it to, and when you do, uh, there may be a delay. So I appreciate everyone's patience and the understanding. Um, so here we here we go. And if you're are you guys getting feedback? Are you good? Awesome. All right. So we can advance to the next slide. So connection and community, what we're here to talk about today. Um, we've already taken the poll, so I'm really grateful for the responses and that. Um, and the uh, the next slide, we can go into um, talking about, this is a, an initial slide we saw in our first session together, where 49% um, of professionals are choosing to move to other U.S. regions at a higher rate. So we saw that the top reasons for BIPOC folks relocating to um, this region were job opportunities. We saw one of the top reasons for this exodus of black and brown talent moving out of this region has been lack of diversity and cultural awareness. I wanted to preface this with there is a rich, deep, long tradition and community of Black people living in Minnesota. We live here, we've built um, lives and community in this space. So I wanted to highlight that today and also provide some insights on how employers can authentically engage and leverage these already existing community spaces that um, are rich in connectivity and truly foster um, authentic engagement and community. Um, so that's what we're going to discuss today. And on the next slide, um, I wanted to just preface, like, coming from HBC myself, as well as uh, folks who were here from on the call today, we are coming out of a thriving supporting community, uh, supportive community. And it's really important to understanding that um, we are communal people, <laughs> the resilience, the strength, and the courage that are attributed to our community has been built over centuries of collectivism. So we look, um, we look out for each other at HBCUs and have been able to withstand a lot of hardships, and I would say heartache because we've stuck together. So I don't, um, I don't know who I would be without my HBCU or where I would be or what I would be doing if I was, if I did not have this, um, not only um, HBCU connection, but connection to my community, to the Black community. So I wanted to just um, to just say, like, we pour into one another, and um, we need each other to continue to thrive in this world and in this space. So um, what, one thing that HBCUs truly offer that we that we don't see in traditional PWI experiences, and PWI, predominantly white institutions, what that means, um, is they offer 
a nurturing and caring environment that teach us how to be strong and pull and pool resources when we need to, as well as these institutions teach us how to advocate for ourselves and also reinforce um, how to find and care for one another. So that's what we're coming out of and then coming to um, a region such as Minnesota to not have that feels very disruptive, um, feels um, um, kind of scary and a little threatening. Um, but like if we can still find ways in which we can foster an authentic community building and intentional relationship building, I think that's one way to truly uh, attract and retain top Black talent in this region. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to just uh, do a, a brief animation of like, what do these what do these networks look like? So there are three areas that we've conducted in our research. My team is conducting the research for addressing um, uh, retainment of Black talent. And there are three spaces that have showed to be prevalent, as well as um, uh, these are all your your results to the poll question also highlighted these. So the ERG affinity groups within workplaces is something that is immensely important to like kind of getting right. And I think this requires some redesign and how we think about um, ERG spaces and the leaders who are uh, showing up in that space. The next bubble, um, is um, professional Black professional networks. So we'll hear from um, Solomon Anderson, who's representing um, as a board of uh, a board member for uh, TC Band. So we'll hear from him in a minute about his experience. And then thirdly is that connection to community. So community connection, churches, uh, local chapters of Black uh, Greek letter organizations. Um, other professional um, and communal networks that exist in the region in which um, folks can tap into and leverage as long as there is some um, authentic connection made and this isn't seen as transactional. So we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, but I wanted to spend some time talking about the ERG space. Um, and I think this is something that every organization should be uh, examining right now. Is your organization adequately investing in ERGs? And when I say adequately, I don't mean just throwing a budget of $10,000 to, uh, to these um, affinity groups every quarter, but ultimately is there a true investment in how to operationalize the, um, the value that they're bringing to your org? Funding and resources. Is there adequate funding to um, truly promote activities and invest in this group of people? Um, it can't just be, depending on the, the size of your org, I think it's important to really be mindful about how much you're investing and how, and how big that community is in your space. Are there dedicated roles? Are these just additions to job core, uh, core job functions? Um, we see that a lot where there are um, not dedicated roles, but this is something that's added on to a, 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 a leader's role where it's not something that's um, um, assessed in their performance review. It isn't something they get extra money for. It is, um, in my opinion, it is extractive. It is expecting labor out of black and brown talent with no reward and no compensation, which is uh, a correlation to what we've seen for the past centuries of how we treat black and brown people. So are you operating from a place of white supremacy and with, with institutions like this, or are you truly trying to be equitable in how we have leaders uh, really framing um, important conversations, strategies, and objectives to help the bottom line of your business? Let's be real about it. <laughs> and then uh, thirdly, internal support to allow participants to, to attend. Um, organizations I've worked in the past and been a part of in the past, we see a lot of our BIPOC talent in certain pieces of the organization that don't provide them the autonomy or the agency to truly even attend these events or foster com the connection and community building that we're asking them to do. So do you have direction, um, organizational leadership that supports your black and brown talent attending these events that isn't about two hours a month, but truly um, champions them connecting across an organization with, um, with um, that, that, and they're not just uh, silent to a call center, right? So being very intentional about like what these leaders mean and say, are their actions aligning with, um, with what they're asking of their workers? And then visible leaders who can enact organizational change. Um, it's really important to um, understand who is leading your ERGs. Are these folks who are may, maybe junior level, who may take on a lot more work um, because 
you know, that's what we expect out of a lot of our junior, or these organizations expect out of a lot of our junior employees, or are they folks who've been embedded in the organization, maybe have a director role and can kind of, can, can leverage their um, social capital, political capital in the organization to really push these initiative, initiatives forward. Additionally, what we saw out of the, um, the uh, after the murder of George Floyd, the activations we saw from organizations was a lot of transitioning of black leadership into DNI roles who do not have practitioner experience in leading this work. So I think it's it's tokenism. <laughs> uh, a lot of organizations have been guilty of it. And then what you get is you hinder the advancement of these ERGs and of this community within your workplace, and you put um, unrealistic expectations on these black and brown people who you call leaders in this space when they may have be coming from um, finance or marketing, right? And then put slotting them into a DNI role, I think is unfair. It is, um, un it is um, unproductive and causes more harm than it does good. So are we truly seeking talent that has a practitioner experience in the DNI space and are how are we leveraging that and supporting them when we do put them in these roles, right? It, it, it can't fall on the black and brown people in your org to push these initiatives forward. We need the leaders to um, understand that this is something they need to take on as well. So I just wanted to preface that that's something that a lot of our research has told us about what happened after the aftermath of George Floyd and how we're still not seeing the progress that we um, are holding ourselves to. So next slide. We will uh, hear from Solomon Anderson. So I'm so grateful that he can be with us today. And I wanted to just provide a little background on, um, on Solomon. Um, in the next slide, we will see a picture of him. But he is a board member for TC Band. And Solomon is a South Minneapolis native, a self-proclaimed geek who is passionate about data and technology. Solomon works for Best Buy as an infrastructure engineer. And in addition to supporting um, Oracle, EBS and other applications. He is a board member for TC Band. He serves as the treasurer of um, uh, Twin Cities Oracle Users Group and is an Oracle ACE associate. So in his spare time, Solomon enjoys um, spending time with his wife and cats and watching sports and volunteering. So I'm super excited that um, Solomon can join us today and I'm going to jump into some panel discussion. Um, pan um, Solomon and I met each other at Best Buy when I was uh, an employee there. So we shared a lot of um, a lot of good memories. I'm so grateful that he can um, be with us in this uh, capacity. So welcome, Solomon, and I will uh, provide you some time to um, uh, tell us about yourself and uh, give us like a little a little brief insight on, um, on TC Band and how you got involved with that organization. Yeah, definitely. So first and foremost, thank you for inviting me here. And hello and good morning to everyone out there who's not on screen. Um, I mean, you pretty much covered it, man. Uh, that, uh, you know, that introduction, thank you for the introduction as well. Uh, but I pretty much covers, you know, I've grown up in Minneapolis all my life, uh, spent time uh, going in between uh, Minneapolis and Detroit. And so uh, pretty early on, I kind of saw the difference in culture between the cities and how, you know, uh, things were in Twin Cities area, Minneapolis particularly, which is a predominantly white area versus Detroit, which has been, you know, black, black, blackity black since like, you know, the sixties. So, um, but, you know, through uh, experiences at St. Thomas, uh, you know, joining a Greek letter organization, I'm happy to be a member of Cap Outside, Trinity Incorporated as well. Um, I, I knew the importance of uh, the work that goes into building community, you know, you have to be, in, like you mentioned, you have to be intentional about it. You have to uh, really make investments and not just, uh, I don't know how to phrase it, but uh, do more than just, you know, promote the people that you think are going to be good in positions. No, you have to, you know, interact with the community uh, and, and do things that are beneficial to the community and not just looking to extract things away from it. And so uh, I got involved with TC Band through uh, just volunteering. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to the, uh, I guess, slide that you had on earlier that had the circles, you know, the ERG affinity groups, Black professional groups, and community groups. Uh, pretty early on at Best Buy, I got involved with uh, BERG, which is the Black Employee Resource Group, uh, and just volunteering, helping out. And from there, uh, it kind of just naturally progressed to helping out with TC band stuff. Uh, there was an opportunity to join the board. I took it and here we are. Mm -hmm. 
and now you're a board member. <laughs> That's usually how that happens. So yeah. we're really grateful for your service in that space. And I, I truly, it, it does start with those internal connections that we make in our workplaces. Um, so thank you for like reinforcing that and highlighting that. I wanted to um, ask, um, through your work with TC Ban, you work with um, a lot of the uh, Black professionals in this Minneapolis-St. Paul region. So I wanted you to share your um, insights on why is it important for Black professionals to connect across organizations? So not just staying in the silos of Best Buy or Target or General Mills, but like why is it important that we build community together throughout our various orgs that we represent? Uh, well, I think it goes back to what you talked about earlier, right? Like a lot of organizations, uh, especially in times like this, make commitments, right? And uh, if left unchecked, a lot of times those commitments don't, aren't followed through in the way that we anticipate. And so I think, you know, step one is just holding each other accountable, right? Uh, and not just each other as individuals, but the organizations that we work with, making sure that, you know, we are doing as much as we can to ensure those equitable outcomes for everyone in the community and not just, you know, certain parts of the community, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, but also, you know, I, I think going, you know, more generally, uh, I'm a student of history. And so I'm, uh, I, how do I phrase this? America has a history of disenfranchising people who look like us. And so I, I think that it's important for us to, you know, acknowledge that and also do what we can to ensure that that kind of thing doesn't happen to not just our communities, but communities abroad. And so uh, a big part of that is connecting with each other, working together and ensuring that, uh, you know, those outcomes happen for uh, our communities. Absolutely. And I would also share a, um, a brief reflection on like the importance that TC Band has like had in my life. Um, I met some of my best friends, some who were actually on this call, um, through TC Band events, and they work for organizations like Target Orlando Lakes, but like I would not have been connected to them without the organization. So I'm really like truly appreciative um, for this network existing and, and how y'all create space for um, Black people across this region. Um, I have a question that I think a lot of employers on the call today um, would really like some insight on. So like what gaps what gaps do these employers have in connecting to and with Black professionals? Um, we're going to be as honest as we can on this call because I think honesty is the best policy. So um, what, what are some gaps that you've identified or that your organization has identified where employers can, can um, improve? Uh, first thing first, representation, right? Um, I think that a big part of the reason why organizations, especially large organizations, have a problem with connecting with the black community and black professionals is there are none in those leadership rooms. And uh, while that's gotten better, you know, passing the Civil Rights Act and we've had people uh, be able to climb the corporate ladder and get in those, those roles, uh, like you were saying earlier, oftentimes those professionals can be siloed and they'll have, um, I'll say an unruly amount of expectations placed upon them by not just, you know, the organization wanting to uh, kind of make them the token DNI professional and the, the super per Huber, hero, hero who does everything. Like, you know, we aren't superheroes, we're human. And we can't do everything for an organization. Um, especially when those organizations have a tendency to uh, not compensate us, I'll say, in uh, line with some of the other leaders in, in those same rooms, right? Uh, it, it's one thing to get, uh, you know, have a Black professional, Black leader who is able to do the work, but it's another thing to ask them to do that for a discount. And I think oftentimes uh, the buck can stop there. You know, I, I know for me, uh, I am very adamant about uh, ensuring that not just I get the conversation that I deserve, but the people that I'm referring jobs to get the conversation that they deserve. Um, and, you know, being in computer science, there's a lot of opportunities where people come to me, hey, I have this idea for an app, you know, uh, and if we build it, we'll make millions of dollars. Uh, do you know anyone who can work, help work on that? And the first thing I always ask, all right, well, is this a paid opportunity? How much are you paying? What, what if I'm going to, you know, leverage my network and 
uh, send an opportunity to someone I know, I don't want them to work for exposure because that doesn't pay bills, <laughs> you know? Um, likewise, I think at the leadership level, a lot of organizations just don't, I'll say, I don't want to say they don't value it, but they don't understand the importance of diversity. And by diversity, I mean more than just skin color, right? That's one aspect of it. That's just surface level, though. There's class diversity. There's uh, educational diversity. There's, uh, you know, uh, if you want to get into it, um, neurotypical diversities, right? Like not everyone thinks the same way. And I think organizations would benefit tremendously if they, you know, not necessarily took uh, those opportunities away from other people, but just allowed other types of people to have those same opportunities, right? Uh, I have, I'm involved with a lot of diversity and inclusion discussions. And one of the things that I always repeat is that diversity isn't about taking one person off the stage and putting another person on. No, it's about sharing the stage and giving opportunity for more people. And I think once organizations start to understand that better, everything else will kind of fall into place. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for, um, I think that was just such a graceful answer about like diversity is more than just skin color, but um, thought, experience, education, all of that. Uh, another question that I have that I think, you know, employers are like really itching to know is how can they um, leverage the TC Band network and other networks for Black professionals? And then with that, I also want to add an additional question is um, what can these employees do to better connect with y'all? How can they support you in this and in, in, as well as your organization? Uh, well, uh, going back to what you were talking about earlier, right? I think first things first is giving people an opportunity to even attend these events, right? Uh, I'm grateful to be working at Best Buy where uh, the organization understands the importance of these type of events and will, you know, oftentimes give us ample time to an opportunity to participate in them, but not every employer is like that, right? Uh, prior to coming for to Best Buy, I was working in the public sector, and uh, there was very little to none, no opportunity to attend events like this because they would expect you to be at your desk, you know, actually working on things. Uh, and kind of my uh, perspective is that, no, this is part of the work, right? If we're going to be creating inclusive communities and uh, empowering people to not just, uh, you know, participate, but develop themselves and get to where they want to go in their careers, you have to give them opportunities to uh, participate in their community. You have to give them opportunities to develop themselves. And you have to create environments where they can do that in a comfortable setting. Um, I mentioned before, or mentioned during the uh, introduction that I'm part of the Oracle ACE program. And so without going into the technical details, right, uh, Oracle is very uh, complex software and oftentimes when I'm going into meeting rooms or training rooms or development or even conferences that are, you know, international conferences sometimes, uh, there are often times where I'm just the one, you know, Black person in the room or one of few Black people in the room. Uh, and, you know, because I've been in the industry for a while, I'm used to it at this point, but for people coming into the industry, that can be a culture shock, especially people coming from, you know, areas of the United States, Washington, D.C., you know, Atlanta, Texas, where they're used to being around other Black people. And, you know, to go from that kind of dynamic to suddenly being the only person in the room that looks like you, it, it can be very challenging. And so, um, you know, providing the opportunity for people to attend, uh, supporting the organizations financially is a huge thing. Uh, TC Band has a number of corporate sponsors and we're incredibly grateful to have them. Uh, and having those sponsors enables us to do things like host events, uh, you know, free of charge where people don't have to pay anything to get development. Where as in some, you know, I'll go back to the Oracle example. Some of those conferences can cost $1,500 for one ticket. And that's, you know, standard entry. That's not even VIP access where you get all the cool drinks and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, like, you know, there's, you have to provide opportunities for, for employees to engage. And you also have to support the organizations that are providing those opportunities to do so, whether it's in the form of financially. So, like, opening those checkbooks and writing those checks, making contributions, um, or just, you know, promoting the events within the employee resource groups letting people know about them, uh, and like I said, making the time and effort to show that they're important, because they are. 
Awesome. Thank you, Solomon. Um, we're really grateful to have heard your voice today. Thank you for honestly sharing your insights and um, in perspective. I know it's never easy <laughs> to be in, in, in platforms like this and then speaking to folks who actually are some of our employers, but um, we are better for it. And i um, so grateful for uh, your service uh, on TC Band, as well as the work you do at Best Buy. Happy to know you and um, thank you for your time today. Yeah, likewise, thank you so much, Halston. Appreciate the invite. And for everyone out there, uh, I always mention this at meetings, but I'm happy to be a resource, especially for folks who are looking to break into IT industry because I'm tired of being the only Black person in these rooms. <laughs> so please, you know, uh, reach out. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'll drop a link in the chat here. Uh, if you're in the Twin, if you're you know in the Twin Cities area and you're looking for opportunities to get engaged, please check out TC Band. Uh, check out, you know, uh, if you're into Oracle stuff, TCOUG. But really just, you know, engage with the community, right? Like Allison said, there's a rich community here. It can be hard to break into that community sometimes. I, I get it. I'm from Minnesota, and the Minnesota nice thing is a whole nother discussion. But yeah. happy to read your source. Uh, feel free to reach out whenever, and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Solomon. Wonderful. So we're going to jump back into the presentation. And the uh, second bubble that we discussed was uh, faith. So um, corporate connections are not are, um, that are not transactional. So I wanted to really spend some, a little bit of time prefacing this, that um, uh, talent, black, when black, black talent comes to this region, um, what I hear often and what our research indicated um, in our strategic planning process was that finding a church home um, is immensely important and also finding one that aligns with your specific practice. Um, I wanted to also talk about the Black church was, has been and I think will continue to be like a cultural cauldron uh, that Black people have created to combat systems of marginalization, oppression, and discrimination um, that ultimately were designed to crush our spirit. Moreover, um, the beauty that um, of the African-American and the Black experience of survival and resilience can be traced directly back to the reinvention of religion for us. Um, and rather that um, the religion en enabled us and, our and our en enables our descendants to learn and to grow and to develop, uh, interpret, and also reinvent the world in which we, uh, we, we exist in. So it's immensely important to, uh, to our connection and to foster community um, for, for us is to find a, a church home. Um, also, I would say historically, the Black church has been, <laughs> has been and continues to be the place uh, for creating individual, systemic, as well as political change within the Black community. Um, and from uh, I would say from the, its origins um, and emergence in the late 18th century to present day, um, the relevance of the Black church has allowed and will continue to serve as um, a safe haven for Black people, as a place to worship together, to grow together, and to uh, leverage and rebuild our communities. So immensely important. Um, and I just, I didn't think this conversation could be had without talking about um, how can how can folks get involved with the Black, with the Black church or just a faith community in general? Because it's immensely important to, um, uh, to connecting uh, with this community in this region. So we're gonna hear um, from Dana Abrams uh, via, um, via uh, video. <laughs> so we're gonna play that in a second. And Dana Abrams uh, is a graduate of Clark Atlanta University. Um, and, uh, but she is, she's from, uh, grew up in Minnesota, left to, for an HBCU, came back to this, uh, this uh, region and works in the St. Paul Public School District, um, as well as she's a member of Shiloh, um, Shiloh Church, and we'll hear from her uh, perspective on the importance of finding a church home and um, leveraging the faith community in this region. So uh, we're going to play the video in one second. Good evening, um, everyone. I'm here with Dana Abrams, um, who is a member of Shiloh. Is it Shiloh Baptist Missionary? Shiloh Missionary Baptist Shiloh Church. Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. Thank you. And um, we're excited to have you in this space with us. And today we're going to talk about the importance of the um, Black church and the faith community 
in retaining talent of color, Black talent in the Twin Cities. So I'm super excited that you can share your insights and your perspective with us. But first, I'd just love for you to share um, a little bit about your background. So please tell, tell me about yourself. Um, where'd you go to school? Where'd you grow up? What brought you to um, the Minneapolis-St. Paul region and what church you belong to? Okay. And why? Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I am from St. Paul. I was born in Ohio. However, once you've lived in a place for over 51 years, you consider that home. And I'm from the Rondo community of St. Paul. Um, I'm a product of St. Paul Public Schools, along with my children, and now my grandson is attending St. Paul Public Schools, and I went to college initially. My family says I'm a professional student, but um, when I graduated from Central High School, I headed down to Clark College, which is now known as Clark Atlanta University, um, which was probably one of the best decisions I ever made in my life because that experience was totally priceless. Taught, taught me a lot about myself and a lot about folks around me and what I could do coming back to St. Paul. After um, leaving Clark, I came back home to St. Paul and started working with Hennepin County. And I was working with the, um, with just the welfare, the food stamps, I was that worker. And I wanted to get out of just being that worker and wanting to help empower people to do something else. Thus, I began my career with St. Paul Public Schools. And at that time I was called what they called a stride case manager. So my goal was to help people move off of public, um, public assistance into employment. Um, I am a member of Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. Um, I have been a member there since I was probably six years old, baptized there, left for a while, but came back home. Um, I feel that Shiloh gives me what I need on a spiritual level, as well as gives me an opportunity to fellowship with other folks who are like-minded and such. So I hope I didn't babble. No, not at all. Thank you for the background. And um I, I I love the the um the mention of coming back home and coming in and having that also not only mean the Minneapolis St. Paul region, but to your home church of of Shiloh. So oh, I'd yeah. love to I'd love for you to provide some perspective on the next question, which is how important is the church to the black community? And how do you think that that helps um helps retain or build community amongst um amongst Black people who are relocating to Minnesota from an HBCU. Okay. Well, what I can tell you is I know growing up in, in St. Paul, I always went to church. I went to my Aunt Ida, bless her heart, had me at Sunday school, regular church, the evening service, BTU on Mondays. Cause and I thought that's what everybody did was go to church. You know, I didn't I didn't know if people did anything different. Um, and then once I had the opportunity to move to Atlanta, which is a whole lot bigger um, when you look at the Black community. And if you look historically, Black churches have been the foundation of so many different things between the civil rights movement, between voting, between education, everything, faith-based organizations are that foundation. Um, with all the things that Black folks have had to go through since our existence, that foundation in the church has what's helped, I believe, to help keep us sane and give us guidance. No, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, the, the church has done so much um, for sustaining a community and building, a, um, assisting in our build, our building of resilience. Mm -hmm. And um, I also wanted to, to ask, like, what function do these churches play in um, facilitating the connection amongst the Black community and also across the Black community? Okay. Um, well, first of all, there's so many different type type of faith-based organizations anymore that we can't just call it the church. I know growing up, it was the Baptist church or you were the Catholic church or the Lutheran church. And while those um, faith-based places are still around, there are a lot of young folks who have wanted to, and not just young folks, but folks in general, who've wanted to get away from the more traditional 
faith-based settings and how they have started a lot of the non-denominational churches and that kind of um that kind of thing and what i can tell you is that you know for that one day a week you're going to have a captive audience whether you are worshiping on sunday morning at 10:30 or you are at the mosque on Saturdays, or whenever your faith-based place um, chooses to worship. And so communication is key, because if you want the word to get out, drop a line to the faith-based folks, because they can get the word out. People come to the churches a lot of time in faith-based organizations because of that same reason. They know that they have a captive group of people. Many people who you may or may not have relationships with, but you're trying to get information out to them. You're trying to get their opinion. You're trying to get them to buy from you. You're trying to whatever. And so the communication that a church or um, place of worship can provide is like priceless. Yeah, no, I never um, thought about that, the insight of it being a place where you have that audience. So providing a space and opportunity for a captive audience to um, increase your messaging, build connections across um, uh, various people, various ages and generations. Um, I never thought about that before. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. I think it's a great call out uh, specifically for this audience who's going to be listening to this recording today. Um, and I think the last question I had is, um, so we have a lot of employers on the line and mm -hmm. um, connectivity and, and ensuring that HBCU talent, once they get here, feels connected to the community to, um, to strengthen like retainment numbers um, is immensely important. So I wanted to um, ask if you can give us some insights on how uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul employers or many Minnesota employers can um, plug into these networks, these faith-based networks um, authentically uh, hmm. through engagement. Um, and um, what, what, what would that look like to do it in I mean, a way that is intentional and purposeful? Yep, and that, that's a huge piece because it's hard enough to try to get pe recruit people to come here just based on the weather. It's hard to get people to come here just based on the fact that what is our percentage of folks who look like them? So when you start looking at folks who are coming from the southern states where their religion or their um, whatever faith they practice, whatever, and they're going to come up here looking for that. And so if you as an employer can even just as part of your, and I know you always have to be careful about crossing the line when it comes to religion and that kind of thing, but I would even say with your welcome packet or whatever you have, provide information if you have these um, churches or mosques or whatever that can provide a pamphlet, a welcome packet or something like that. But in order for you to get into those folks, you're going to have to build relationships and you're going to have to be authentic, truly authentic when you go in there and try to build their relationships because you're trying to recruit folks to come up here. The faith-based um, avenue is just one way, but you cannot come into their house and one, take things for granted. You cannot be fake because faith-based folks will look all through you like a piece of glass and they are not going to be willing to help you. And so I think whoever is going to make those kind of connections has to truly want to do that type of work um, because you're going to get the greatest support from your faith-based places. When I, um, as a school district employee, working in the Office of Family Engagement and Community Partnerships, I get, I am able to, because I have established relationships with faith-based faith faith organizations, that I can get information to those folks. I have my key contacts who I know that they know that if they get something from Dana, that that means we need to get this word out. But they wouldn't do that if they didn't have the trust and they didn't have the relationship. 
So what I'm going to say is, I believe everyone wants to do what's in the best interest of the, hopefully their new employee and getting them connected, but just don't take that other side um, for granted when you're when you're trying to make that connection. Absolutely, Dana. Um, you I, you haven't participated in the previous sessions, but a common thread uh, throughout our discussions with this in this forum has been the importance of cultivating relationships based on trust and and purpose and intentionality, and in not being transactional as a lot of corporations and organizations have been in the past. So we're mm -hmm. looking at ways to um, to reformulate what being in community truly looks like, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of the points you made today like really hit on that. So I want to express my deepest gratitude to you for sharing your insights with us. I know yes, the employers you. on this phone are super excited to um, uh, to hear from you. And again, I'm so grateful for you and the work that you do in the school district, as well as at Shiloh. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Dana. Awesome. Uh, so I'm really grateful that Dana was able to provide some um, perspective with us. And I also wanted to um, uh, uh, do a polling question. Let's let's get some more engagement going. So um, I know if, uh, if Emily wants to throw the next polling question up, it's um, if you're a member of the faith community, how did you become connected to that community? Uh, so if we can briefly take some time to do that. I'm seeing through friends. I love to see how this shifts <laughs> uh, through family. Yep, through family. Through family. I think that, that might end up being the winner. And I think that also speaks to uh, um, a lot of folks on the call who may not be uh, transplants to this place. So I think keeping that in mind as well is important. So seeing that that is the, the largest, um, that indicates to me that like you, your family may have ties to this, this space. And um, the second coming in is through friends. And I think a lot of those connections and friendships we make are um, through our professional and uh, personal networks here in the community. So the next polling question also hits at the importance of um, uh, Greek letter organizations in our community. So um, Emily, if you want to share the next one, are you a member of a Greek letter or a Black Greek letter organization? If so, uh, you can drop the name in the chat. I think representation is immensely important. <laughs> so if y'all want to uh, use the chat function to um, to um, exclaim who you're representing today, that'd be great. And so what I'm seeing is predominantly the responses on here are no, but the folks who are welcome and thank you. And uh, I wanted to just give a little bit of background on, um, on, on the importance of Black Greek letter organizations in our community, in, in our community and how they came to be. Um, they came into fruition in like the early 20th century due to um, a lot of the trials and tribulations that Black people were facing at the time in the United States. Also, the inclusion of Black people in universities already proved to be um, uh, very trying. Um, for students in the early 1900s. So often uh, ostracized and banned from joining many social organizations, um, Black students began searching for ways to, uh, to foster community and come together uh, collectively. So the divine and organizations and community um, uh, these organizations, uh, some of which are over 100 years old, have contributed countless hours of service and scholarship and leadership to communities around the world. Um, and though they, they, they all have, um, they may differ in their founding principles in a way, um, in one way or another, they collectively come together as a unified body to create social change and to leave this world a better place. Um, so yet again, each of these organizations deserves um, uh, deserves recognition and also a deeper insight into the work that they really do in a day to day and day and out um, to honor um, uh, uh, fraternities and sororities. So many of um, our celebrated leaders within the Black community are members of the Divine Nine organizations, and they also continue to foster uh, talent, um, talented individuals. Um, throughout the years. Uh, most recently, these organizations also have been encouraged. 
um, uh, to connect uh, uh, to uh, to connect um, within their core missions of um, of community service. So I, I think it's immensely important that we celebrate, we honor, and we also call recognition to existing organizations that have been in community, that have done the hard work, and intimately know um, uh, what our needs are um, as as a as a body of people. So we are going to panel. I also wanted to just provide a little brief slide on um, uh, uh, the organizations uh, that we'll talk about today. So the next slide. Um, this is just uh, a brief uh, timeline of the uh, fraternities on the left-hand side and the sororities on the right-hand side of the Divine Nine. And again, these are Black Greek letter organizations. So you'll see that, you know, starting in 1906 and um, uh, also the the last fraternity established in the um, Divine Nine was in 1963, but they have been monumental and pivotal to the advancement of um, of 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 uh, Black professionals as well as like uh, the Black community in this uh, th throughout the world, not only in the United States. So we have a panel, and I'm super excited that we. Um, uh, have folks who are representing some of our employers today, as well as representing their Greek letter organizations. So I'm going to um, uh, uh, ask Andrea, Gareth, Prophet, and Terry to be pinned so they can be speakers. Um, and we're going to go into a really, I think, exciting, engaging uh, fireside chat with folks who are uh, graciously sharing time and space and energy with us today. So um one moment while we get you pinned up, but uh, Gareth, you're the first person I see. So do you want to provide us with um, uh, a brief introduction of yourself? Uh, where are you employed? What university did you attend if you, um, if, and, if and when you attended an HBCU? And also um, the Black Greek Letter organization you're representing today. And then we'll take it from there. <clears throat> Sounds good. Well, thanks, Austin, for the invitation. Um, thanks for the entire time of the entire group too. My name is Gareth Hubbard. Uh, I have uh, I am a member, um, part of a team member at Lando Lakes Incorporated, uh, where I've been there for almost six years now, um, and just had a wonderful time and learned a lot of things while I've actually been there. Um, I attended Florida A and M University, located in Tallahassee, Florida, um, and I am a proud, proud third generation member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, a legacy that was first began with my grandfather at Morehouse, continued by my father at Fort Valley State University, and then continued by me and my younger brother. And as yes. Solomon and as Solomon says, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> And I'll, I'll have Andrea come up next uh, to uh, follow that wonderful introduction. So Andrea, name, uh, uh, organization you're representing, um, and uh, HBCU, or university you attended. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Hubbard. You guys just heard from my husband. Um, I am originally from Hickory, Mississippi. I attended school at the University of Arkansas Monticello for undergrad. Um, but I had the pleasure of attending an HBCU for graduate school, Alcorn State University in Norman, Mississippi. Um, I relocated uh, here to Minnesota um, to work at Lando Lakes. And just like my husband, I've been here for about six years as well. And I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Awesome. And I see Prophet. Prophet, do you want to go next? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Prophet Ado. Uh, I was born in Fort Worth, Texas, but I've lived in Minnesota my whole life. Uh, grew up um, in the East Metro area, so West St. Paul, Woodbury type area. Uh, went to college at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and there I joined um, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And um, in my day job, I currently work as an advocate advertising account supervisor um, at Carmichael Lynch. So I'm over all of, um, I'm a programmatic lead on the digital media focus. So all of the little tiny Subaru digital banners that follow you around when you go to their site, that's of my um, invention. So there you go, that's me. 
Awesome. And I'm waiting, we're waiting for Terry to jump back on. It seems that she may have been disconnected. So once she jumps on, I'll provide her space and opportunity to provide some background on her. But I wanted to jump into the first question just to ensure that we can stay on time. So if any or um, one or all of you would like to just provide some um, background on how did you get connected with the Minneapolis uh, chapters of your Greek letter organization? So whoever would like to start can go. Well, ladies first, so I'll hop in. <laughs> um, so I actually, uh, I was initiated here in Minnesota, the Delta Phi Omega chapter here in the Twin Cities um, in fall of 2019. So that's how I got connected with my Black Group Letter organization. Okay. Uh, so the wonderful thing about fraternity and sororities, specifically Black Letter Greek organizations, is that our networks are just so incredibly fast. So before I even took my first step into the Minneapolis Twin Cities area, my profites, um, I'll define that term, the people who came before me in the organization had already made inroads for me before I came here. They gave me the rundown, the download on the actual scene. Uh, they looped me in with influential brothers, uh, brothers that were in the area. Um, and as soon as I got here, individuals that I didn't know at all reached out to me just to make sure that I had that sense of home and that even though I was so far away from Georgia, um, I, still held, I, I still had and felt brothers. Um, and that was incredibly important. And they played a huge part in keeping me here um, because I just, I didn't have family besides, of course, my, my wife, my girlfriend at the time. So just having that sense of uh, family, just having that sense of tie-in, uh, just created that stickiness here in this uh, Twin Cities area. And then uh, for me, uh, I kind of came up through, um, you know, the, the K through 12 education system here in Minnesota. Um, and through that, I'm, I started in a, a rites of passage program and a lot of the mentors there were, you know, members of other, you know, Greek letter organizations like Omega Psi Phi or Kappa Alpha Psi, Alpha Phi Alpha. And I don't know for anyone who um, has graduated um, from the University of Minnesota, let's say within the past, you know, 10, 15 years, um, there's a program for all the multicultural students that, um, uh, get accepted to the university that happens within your first few weeks of uh, attending the U, which is called the, you know, multicultural kickoff um, that is um, housed in the MK Center. So the Multicultural Center for Academic Excellence. And then there was this huge like step show. So there were only, you know, the uh, uh, male Greek letter organizations at the time. And I really wanted to figure out, you know, from a family with me being the oldest uh, child with no brothers, you know, what does, you know, Black community look like for me in, in, in my next step of a collegiate career? And I got in touch with, um, you know, one of the members on campus. And the thing that really stood out to me about my organization was they're like, first do your research, but then also ask yourself, you know, where do you want to be potentially at the end of your college career? And the one thing that one of the brothers looked at, he was like, listen, I want you to be um, in a better position than I was when I graduated college. So it was almost a, you know, I am my brother's keeper type initiative before Obama kind of kicked that off in, you know, the, the 20, 2014. Um, so in, in going down that route, I joined the 1985 um, charter of our organization um, of Pi Eta. Um, those are the two Greek letters um, that uh, represent um, our chapter here in Minnesota on the undergrad level. Um, but our organization was um, founded um, in Washington, D.C. Um, at Howard University. So um, to look at, you know, all of the years that have transpired from our inception in 1914 to a charter happening locally in Minnesota in 1985, um, you know, my organization and the brothers in the state come from a long line of, um, you know, connection and in, 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 in black, black excellence. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you all for sharing uh, those insights. So I have a question about community. And I would like um, if any or all uh, of you would like to share a perspective on like, what does community um, mean to you personally, as well as from um, your Greek letter organizational lens? So uh, whoever would like to go first, I would love, I would love some insights on that. That's a really good question, Austin. Um, so immediately, right, 
community, what comes to mind? One, I think of first and foremost, safety, right? Um, not only do I feel physically safe, but do I feel safe to be myself? Do I feel safe to engage, right? We have a, a saying here that I love here at Land Oasis. When you think about diversity and inclusion, it's all about three primary parts. One, are you invited to the party? Uh, the second part is, okay, when you're at the party, do you actually dance, right? And then the third part is, if you're dancing, are you dancing like no one's watching? Are you dancing as though you're just enjoying yourself and being and being free? So when I think about that throughout the lens of um, Black Greek letter organizations, one, they provide a lot of us just that sense of, who I can breathe, right? Because of course, as people have stated before, um, <laughs> that, that, that code switching, right? Or having to actually switch from, okay, this is corporate Gareth, and then this is Gareth outside of work. It takes a lot of energy. So with all that energy that is being expended, you also need that energy to kind of fill yourself back up. And that's what being around my brothers, and not only my brothers, like I have my, I have my wife, uh, who's AKA, and I have my best friend in the world, also on the call, Profit. Um, Profit's not a member of my organ of, of my organization. Um, but when I got here, uh, just knowing that he understood the dynamics of Black Greek letter organization, he understood what it, what it meant to strive for something greater, greater than yourself. He knew what it meant to practice altruism. Um, we just clicked off the bat. And uh, even though we're not from the same branch of the Greek letter organization, I look at him as coming from the same tree. And I just found safety in that. That's such a beautiful answer, Gareth. So I don't know if anyone else wants to go up to Gareth because I wouldn't. Um, but but I will. <laughs> I see, having too much fun on these conversations because I know all of you personally. But I wanted to ask um, Gareth. I think a follow up to that. I love the analogy about um, the the dancing at the party, right? And mm -hmm. when we think about equity, are they playing the music that you're dancing to? That's what we want to say. That's what we want these organizations to do, right? But I think uh, another question I had about um, uh, connectivity to um, to this region, I think, um, um, Gareth, I would actually like to, um, Gareth and Prophet, I would like to know, what did your Greek undergrad engagement look like? And then how does it differ from your current involvement? Um, would you all like to provide some insights on that? And then I'll go to Andrea for another question. Yeah. Um... For me, I think to, to jump off from how I joined, what was really amazing was I had some some really connected brothers who joined at, you know, Morehouse um, and, you know, different HBCUs. So um, in, in my undergrad, I actually had the opportunity to serve on our national board um, as one of the um, undergraduate um, collegiate members at large, and then also the second vice president of the organization for um, a period of four years from 2011 through 16. And in that time, um, I was able to, you know, connect with chapters, not just in the state, but all across the country. Um, we were able to, you know, implement new programs and then also figure out, you know, different ways to serve different, you know, communities and Black youth, I think, across the um, you know, the East Coast and even in, you know, Minnesota itself. Uh, in um, being a, a member of the student unions and activities at the U of M, a part of the um, implementation and programming thrust that they give us there is to host different events and things like that throughout the year. So we're able to partner with organizations like the BSU, uh, Multicultural International Student Association, like different cultural hubs. Um, that we're really able to like give a nice flair and flavor and taste to, you know, what it means to be a member of a Black Greek organization, but then also, you know, what it means to express, you know, just Blackness in general. Um, and, and as you transition from the undergrad to the alumni chapter, it's, it's, it's a different type of connection because they, they, our organizations um, encourage a lifelong membership. It's not just you pay your dues and you're in and out or you, um, serve some time and then you go off. It's something that you wear on your heart, on your sleeve, you know, for as long as, you know, you live. So uh, transitioning to the alumni chapter now, what we're mainly focused on is, 
matriculation of the college chapters and then figuring out, you know, different local um, ways we can continue to be involved in the community. Well, uh, I'm sure the audience doesn't want to hear about beer pong and uh, beach games. Um, <laughs> that's part of a member of a Florida fraternity guy. Um, but I think I'll just lean on Prophet here um, as an example to that question. Uh, I think Prophet being a bit humble, um, he's not telling his entire story. I mean, Prophet was almost what, 19, 20 years old um, as, as a leader of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Guys, I mean, team, that's huge. That's huge. And, and I think that's, that's the beauty of it. At that tender age of 19, 20, he was leading strategic actions across an entire organization that is, all, that is 106 years old right now. That's the beauty of it. Right, they really prepare you and develop you and train you to become the leaders and really effectuate true change across not only your communities but the entire society. Um, and that's and that's the and that's the true beauty of these black letter organizations. You're uh, you're allowed safety. You're allowed the chance to take chances, lead and fail. But also too, when you think about just the genesis of these organizations, like for Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, for example, they were created in 1911 by 10 men going to school at Indiana University. Um, we all know that Indiana has a um, long tie-in with the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> and it was, an extremely, it was an extremely racist place, especially in, early, in the early 20th century. So could you just even for one second imagine the things that these Black men went through trying to find and form some sense of community back, back in 1911, right? And the lessons learned from that um, the values that were honed, the skills developed, that's all been passed down over these past hundred years. And we're, and, and these young individuals, 18, 19, 20, are still learning some of those same lessons to exceed and succeed in spite of. Um, you go through a process, you're trained, hey, excuses are only tools of incompetence, used to build monuments of nothingness. That's something that I learned as a 20 year old that there are no excuses, no matter what happens. So get the job done, right? Empathy, altruism, all of these things are honed and, and really refined in the forges of these uh, black letter organizations, which is why they're so incredibly important. I don't know if that answered your question. I think, I, I, I hope it answered a, a bit of your question. Also. It totally did. And I think it really reinforced what Prophet said. And I know Gareth is preaching right now and I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Andrea, I wanted to ask, since you have a, a unique experience, um, how has your organization um, assisted in your communal connection to the Minneapolis-St. Paul region? Because I know you're not from here, um, but I, I would just really love for you to share um, how that's assisted in your connectivity to, um, to calling Minnesota home. Um, that is a good question. Um, like I said earlier, I am from Mississippi and relocating here. It was very hard. To Dana's point, the weather was one. And the second point she made was, how many people in Minnesota look like me? Um, I am a newbie to Black Greek letter organizations. I was initiated fall of 2019. Um, but I will say, being connected with those like-minded women have definitely kept me here. Um, Gareth just spoke to, when you're coming in, like they're providing you the development, like you're learning, you're failing, you're growing along the way. And I will say, as an initiate of fall of 2018, I dived right in, right? As part of my organization now, I lead one of our targets. I serve as the assistant treasurer and I have women holding my hand along the way. And just that connection to those women, those relationships that I've been able to build with women that I didn't even know were in this community have definitely made my strides, my ties here um, much stronger. Beautiful. And I think, Andrea, I have a, a, a last question that I would like you to start. But for, um, for the employers on the phone, what advice can you give on how they can engage and support connectivity amongst uh, Black Greek letter organizations and Black talent who's relocating to the Minneapolis-St. Paul region? So um, I know it's a lot in one question, but if you could uh, um, start us off and then I'll go profit Gareth. Um, so yes, thank you. Sounds good, and I will keep this brief. Um, we've kind of spoken about this on the call, right? Like Profit joined as an undergraduate student, Garrett, et cetera. But I think one of the things that employers miss is when they think, when they think about sororities and fraternities, 
they only think about undergraduate students, right? And for Black Greek letter organizations, I joined in a graduate chapter. I was initiated here in the Twin Cities. Um, and, and just them being aware that, hey, if I'm recruiting college students and they're a part of a Black Greek letter organization, this is a connection point, right? Like Gareth mentioned, before he ever moved here, he had his brothers reaching out to him, making sure he was okay, he knew the ins and outs before his arrival. And if employers can tap into that and like just become knowledgeable about, about those types of things, um, I think it makes for a better recruiting strategy for them. Beautiful, Prophet, do you wanna take uh, tackle that question as well? Yeah, I think um, a lot of our, our Greek letter organizations have a very strong business acumen. So if you have your annual recruiting fairs and I and are looking to increase you know your level of engagement across um, the partners you partner with reach out to these natural headquarters figure out where their next events are at and figure out okay in our calendar year where can we devote devote some of our you know funds towards you know getting our our organization name out there because again these students who have then graduated and are now alumni are still mid-career. They're still figuring out where they're going to go next. So I think you'll have the pick of the litter if you're going to them versus like, oh, we'll wait to, to for some organizations to come and find us. So I think just be proactive on the ground there. Um, and then also, I think, uh, be hyper-focused in, in the way you personalize. Like, I think we work in organizations now where we're trying to cater to our consumers in a very, you know, data-focused way. I think it's like, what data points can you gather that actually kind of promote in, an actual archetype of the, the, the employee you're looking to hire and build custom, you know, recruitment programs around that? Um, so a couple of points uh, that I just want to state. So first and foremost, um, if you look out across the entire space or just society, I find it by no happenstance that most of your African-American leaders are connected to a Black Greek metal organization. That is by no happenstance. These organizations go out at the undergraduate level and they recruit the cream of the crop. They recruit high potential candidates. Even they recruit hypos before organizations <laughs> even have the chance to recruit hypos. It's just ingrained in the culture. So I say all that to say just for general awareness, if you if you want to identify just top tier candidates, specifically from HBCU or Black Letter Organization, it's such a huge undercurrent of, of that society. You have to go out and you have to acclimate and you have to make yourself aware of these organizations. You have to do your due diligence, right? And the thing is, they're not hiding. <laughs> they're right there. Once you go on, on an HBCU site, you're going to see plots. You're going to see specific colors represented all across the area. Go out. Curiosity is key. Go out and find, ask questions. And once you begin to ask those questions, gain general awareness, and then just begin to gain context, um, there's just going to be an abundance of talent there. Um, so, I mean, that's the only piece. I think Andrea and Prophet pretty summarized everything else. Beautiful. Uh we love to see this. And uh, again, I know all of you very personally, and I'm so grateful that um, employers on this call could just have a piece of your light. I get to see it every day, but um, I love y'all. I thank you for your insights. Again, we're better for it. So um, thank you for the time. It was really important to have your voices in this um, uh, the, this piece of the forum about community and connectivity. So um, I'm grateful to you all for being a part of my community me, community, and me being a part of yours. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Yes, yes. Love y'all. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to jump like into our final like nine minutes of the presentation. Y'all been rocking with us for three weeks. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Emily Fitzsimmons. Um, who is our managing director for um, this initiative. So Emily's gonna give you some um, insight on how to uh, plug in, tap into this network, and then I'll, I'll round us out at the end. So Emily. 
Yeah, thank you, Halston. Well, as Halston said, thank you for hanging with us through these three weeks. It's been great to see the conversation progress and to get where we are. But if you remember, we started with some um, calls to action from some leaders, um, both in the employer group that helped put this on, as well as um, some calls to action from members of the greater MSP staff. So just to iterate, so Angel Udin from Blue Cross Blue Shield, the Director of Diverse, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, um, called us all to utilize these resources that were created together. So not to go at it alone, to recognize that you have peers both on this call, those that have participated throughout the last three weeks, and those that may not even know that this forum exists yet that are solving the same problems in real time. So to continue to come back to this table. And that was another call to action that was also shared by Sydney Bickerstaff, our Vice President of Operations at Greater MSP, when she talked about the impact that we can have together as a coalition. Um, our motto at Greater MSP is that we're greater together, and that's not just a fun pun spin of words, but it is true. It's true in this work, it's true in all areas of inclusive economic growth. And then, so some immediate calls to action um, that you can do today. So um, in a recap of our event, what we'll do is we'll share out an opportunity um, for these three uh, different activities. First, sign up. This is not the end of this forum. This is the beginning of it. So um, a way to stay um, in close contact with the work, to know that we have you know, future forums, events, new resources that are coming out. In the recap from this event, we'll share out a chance to sign up to receive those updates. Um, don't only sign up yourself, pass it along to members of your organization as you begin to build out your HBCU engagement strategy, not just with a small group of individuals, but across your organization and even across your networks for um, people that maybe aren't participating in it yet. Um, send that along so we can continue to spread this word and build this coalition. Second is to download and review the HBCU engagement strategic uh, framework that we'll be releasing next month. So throughout these last three sessions, Halston has been sprinkling in some of the findings that are summarized in that extensive um, framework that we'll be sharing. And I say extensive because um, it is a large document. It has a lot of insight, a lot of historical context, a lot of regional context, um, talking through, you know, not only the landscape of HBCU institutions, but the alumni and Greek networks. And our call to action to you isn't to download it and think that you'll be able to go through every page and tackle everything at once, but to identify where your unique organization can have the most impact. Start where you are. Um, again, it's not just about what can you get the most out of, where can you start to have that transactional relationship with HBCUs, but where can you have true impact um, long term. And then third, and something that was really talked about today is this community connection. So this is something that we hear over and over and over again for all newcomers, but especially for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color that move to the region, is that connecting to the cultural amenities that exist here um, is tough. So over the course of 20, uh, the spring of 2021, we've been developing a new digital cultural amenities guide. We're really excited to um, launch it uh, next month different than the one that you may have seen from Make It MSP in 2019, which was a PDF. This is meant to be a live crowdsourced resource. So it'll be um, a living digital asset that lives at makeitmsp.org um, that is more constantly uh, shifting through and finding new submissions, ways to continue to build this out, see what's missing, um, as well as answer some frequently asked questions that are received by pre um, professionals of color when they move to the region. So those are our calls to action. Um, who, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't also end with a really warm thank you. And before I even jump into thinking uh, the full employer enterprise team and community partner team, I wanna give a shout out to Halston and the <laughs> relations team. Um, Halston joined us in October of 2020 and has stuck with it, this team of more than 16 um, employer partners working through uh, this really tough, intensive, and intentional project. And um, Halston and the Rooted Relations team, I would recommend them to anyone and everyone um, as a DEI consultant and also as a person and friend And Halston. I just can't thank you enough. Our, this project is better having you part of it and our region is better having you part of it too. So I wanted to Aww. say that. Thank you, Emily. Emily, before I shed tears. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I appreciate this. And I also felt personally connected to this, being an HBC graduate, being from this region, and also leaving. 
I never wanted to leave Minnesota. I never wanted to leave um, one of these employees on this call. I am now at Google, thank God for it. But like, I never thought this would be a part of my journey that I would have to relocate because of the culture here. So I think that, yo, that speaks volumes, like <laughs> not only for my participation in this space and in this project, but ultimately my personal life. So I want y'all to get this right. I'm committed to y'all getting this right. And unfortunately I can't be with you on that entire journey, but I hope this sparks some interest and some activation and some engagement and urgency to get it right. So um, those are, that's my final thought. And I'm so grateful to have um, spent these past three weeks building community with you. And if you wanna reach out and connect with me, please do so. Um, uh, my Ruta Relations team, again, Ruta Relations is, is my company. It's a DNI uh, and it's in PR consulting firm. I don't know if I made that clear in the beginning. I actually own it. But um, we do this work constantly. We live this work. We breathe this work. So I'm so grateful to have served in this capacity. And I'm grateful to seeing um, what, what the outcomes of this are. So thank you, Emily. All right. Well, with that, we'll close today again. Um, be on the lookout for the recap and all those opportunities. And thank you for being with us. Um, our door is always open for questions and chance to invite more people to the table. So thank you. Have a great rest of your day and enjoy the Minnesota spring sunshine. Thank you. Bye.